thanks very much for coming along this evening. Um, I'm Juliet Garside and uh, I'll be moderating. Um, I'm a, a financial reporter at The Guardian and um, I've worked on, on some of our big offshore investigations, um, and uh, including last year's Panama Papers. So this week is, uh, marks the 10th anniversary of the collapse of Northern Rock and the earthquake events which marked the beginning of, of the financial crisis. I think we all agree, probably, that another crisis will happen again uh, at some point, but tonight we'll be looking at what the causes might be next time. Um, the discussion is called, How Can We Avoid Another Crisis? Um, it's obviously a very, very difficult question to answer. Um, but we have a fantastic panel um, of economists and campaigners and authors here tonight. And, and I know because I've spoken to them about it, they've, they've got some very, very interesting insights to share into to where the, the dangers are lurking um, and how they've grown in the last 10 years. So I'm going to ask each panel member to speak for a few minutes and then we'll take some questions from you. Um, and we'd also like to hear not just your questions but your thoughts and your opinions. So please feel free to take the floor and, and share your thoughts. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce our, our speakers. Um, to my far left is Daniel Muga. Am I pronouncing that correct? That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> he is Professor of Political Arithmetic at the University of Amsterdam which is a very intriguing job title. Um, and essentially, if I'm not wrong, Daniel, you research the political baggage that can skew the economic data that governments use for their measuring and their forecasting. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and Daniel's also an expert on European financial markets, and he directs some research on the banking crisis and financial sustainability as part of the EU financed Enlightened Research Project. And uh, next to me is Daniela Gabor. Now, Daniela is Professor of Economics and Macrofinance at the University of the West Kingdom. And she's an expert on banking and capital controls. And she's particularly interested in shadow banking and what she calls shadow money. And she's preparing a book on this subject at the moment and she's going to be telling us more about it during her presentation. To my far right is, is Nick Shackson. Um, uh, he is a writer and investigative journalist, um, and the author of uh, one of the most influential books that I've read in recent years, Treasure Islands, which tells the story of uh, how Britain's offshore empire grew out of the ruins of its colonial empire. And um, the book is also for the inspiration for the film, um, which some of you may be seeing, which will be screening after this discussion, called Spider's Web. And finally, Richard Murphy, um, who is a chartered accountant, an anti-poverty campaigner and a tax expert. He's professor of political economy at City University and the author of a number of books, including The Joy of Tax. And he has been described as Jeremy Corbyn's economics guru, but he does reject that title, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you have definitely advised the TUC. Oh, yes. Tax policy. <laughs> Good. I got that right. Um, before handing over to Daniel, who's going to speak first, um, I just wanted to do a short poll with you, the audience, um, uh, and I've got a question for you uh, about um, about ten years on from the, from the financial crash. I've got a couple of questions actually. So I wanted to know whether you think we are in a better or worse situation than we were, whether now we are in a better or worse situation than we were before last financial crash, so, so 10 years ago, are we at greater risk now? If you think so, would you, if you think yes, would you, would you put your hands up? Okay, so maybe half, half the audience. And are we in a better situation than we were a year ago, or have the risks increased in that time period? Do you think yes, hands up? So probably on balance, no, but there are clearly some, some long-term systemic risks. Okay, so. So Daniel, would you like to kick off? Sure. Thanks very much, Juliet. Um, I know it looks ominous when somebody sort of like gets up and walks to a lecture, and certainly when they come from university, that sounds like they want to speak for ages. I won't, let me promise you. Um, but I do want to share my thoughts about where we are at this present juncture and what the risks are of potential repeat of a financial crisis, or a different kind of financial crisis, and what we might be able to do to forestall it. 
Now, if you believe the standard narrative of what happened during the run-up to the financial crisis and its aftermath, you might actually say that we're in a pretty good position, because that standard narrative basically identified three different villains, three different causes of the financial crisis. There was greedy bankers, there was financial derivatives that had completely gotten out of control, and there was financial regulators who were asleep at the wheel and didn't have a clue what was going on. If that's your story, then the good news is that on all three fronts, things have happened, right? You know, we've taken care of some of the darker corners of OTC derivatives markets. To different degrees, we've done something about executive pay and trying to align remuneration incentives with the risks within financial institutions. And I think it is fair to say that regulators in the UK, but also elsewhere, also on the other side of the Atlantic, have actually woken up to some of the risks in the financial system. But I think that that view is actually misunderstanding fundamentally the root cause of financial crises. Because if you look at, back at the history of financial crisis, actually it turns out you don't need greedy bankers, you don't need complex derivatives, and you don't need negligent regulators to get huge financial bubbles that, that come crashing down with pretty extreme consequences. To my mind, the core of financial crises is actually a toxic mix of two things. An excessive debt mountain sloshing around the financial system, and an institutionally fed over-optimism about the value of that debt, and hence an artificial inflation of the wealth that the people who own the debt actually have. Let's take a look at those two things in turn. So first, I hope you can see it from back there. What you see here is total debt levels, and I've picked three countries, of China, the United States, and the United Kingdom. Orange is China, the green is the United Kingdom, yellow is the United States. This is data that's taken directly from the Bank for International Settlements, and it aggregates three sectors of the economy, non-financial corporations, the government, and households. Now what you see here is that debt levels for all three countries have risen significantly since the crisis, so roughly in the middle of the graph, for those of you who can't see it, that's 2007-2008. Now the reasons for that increase in aggregate debt levels are different between the countries. In the United States, this is mostly a story of corporate debt that has exploded over recent years. In China, there's also a lot of corporate debt in here. There's also an increase in government debt as well as household debt, but there also it's mostly a corporate debt story. Let's take a closer look at the United Kingdom, though, because you know that's the story that concerns us most. If you break down what has happened to UK debt, then you see these three different components that I mentioned earlier. The government, the non-financial corporations, so that's basically everything about the banks and the financial sector, and households and non-profits who are also under that heading. What you see there that is that the large chunk of the increase of total debt in our system here is counted for by government debt. Now, the thing there is the following, that if we zoom in on that debt, as we'll see in a minute, it's highly overvalued. But let's take a step back first and ask why is debt a problem in the first place? Now debt is obviously a problem if those who owe the money find that they can't pay it back. But there's another more pernicious problem. Because there's always somebody on the other side, their creditors, the people who hold this debt, and if the debt is tradable, they probably have it on their books at market value. What the value is if you actually sell that bond right here and right now. That's what they put on the asset side of their balance sheets. Now, take a closer look then at this, my final graph. What you see here is two lines. The one, the lower line, the blue line, is the nominal value of UK government debt. Now, that sounds like a little bit of tech talk, but what that means is basically the money that the UK government actually owns, what it has to pay back. <coughs> the green line is the market value. UK government debt. And as you can see, the gap between the nominal value and the market value has increased. What that means is that there are entities out there, there could be institutional investors, banks, pension funds, whoever, who have debt on the asset side of their balance sheets that's actually valued at a much higher price than the money that will eventually come back to them, because that's what the UK government, the nominal debt, that it has to pay back. Why do we see this gap? ultra-low interest rates, obviously, right? You know, if money has nowhere to go, then it's going to flow into asset classes somewhere that pays some kind of return. Now, I think we'll all agree that 
interest rate level that we have right now, certainly in terms of real interest rates, which are still negative in many places, can't be sustained indefinitely. What that means is that that gap that you see there at the far right end eventually has to close. This can't go on. Right now, it's roughly 25 percentage points of UK GDP. And you see different kinds of asset bubbles of this kind of sort elsewhere in the global economy. Now, when that gap closes, that means that on the asset side, of our economies, there's going to be a gigantic meltdown. And if you consider the leverage that we have, so the absolute debt levels, it means that that is a financial crash in the making. Now, to round up, because we said we just say a few words right here, what can we do about something like this? Now, obviously, if excessive debt and a faulty valuation due to artificially low interest rates is the problem here, then we somehow have to get rid of that debt now. And the only real answer that I see is some form of redistribution. Because what that means, and this is government, but for households we have a similar story, is effectively the poor or the have-nots borrowing from the haves and the rich. That is how we finance the system and keep it going. But as I said, this is unsustainable, not for reasons of fairness, but for reasons of sustainability. The only way to get rid of that is effective redistribution. Because if you don't do that, again, never mind the fairness argument, then we'll keep that financial debt water hat sitting on top of our economies. We're all going to be in trouble when that comes crashing down. Thank you very much. I'll leave that. Do you want me to ask you a question? Okay. How will you redistribute the debt? How can we do that? Well, obviously, when it comes to debt redistribution, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is taxation. Um, and there's been a long-standing argument that once you stop taxation and really ramping it up, that that's going to act as a break on economic growth, right? That has been sort of like the mainstay argument why we shouldn't be doing that. But frankly, I don't think that that's true. Because, you know, just taking money from here and putting it over there doesn't mean that it's not going to be spent on things, you know. Chances are actually it's going to be spent on stuff that will do much more for economic growth rather than being funneled away in some, you know, funny financial channel or something. So to my mind, unpopular as that argument may be, I think there's room for much more redistribution through taxation and it's actually going to be good for economic growth, not bad. Uh, hello everybody, uh, I'm afraid I cannot uh, make good on the promise to talk about shadow money because I haven't worked out how to talk about it in seven minutes, uh, usually it's 45 and one and a half hours, uh, instead I will talk about uh, and very much, well not very much but to some extent disagreeing with uh, what Daniel has said which is uh, I think constructive in some ways. I will talk about what I think is a paradox of the era of financial capital that we've lived in for the last 30 years. And this paradox is that while we have uh, what Daniel described as a excessive debt, debt mountain sloshing around, I will argue that we don't have enough of the right kind of debt. Right? So we don't have enough of the right kind of debt and the seeds of the next crisis are with, uh, within this uh, paradox of how to generate the right kind of debt. And I will, at the end, possibly explain why I think we shouldn't worry about this growing bubble at all. Uh, so, where does my story start? Uh, it starts from this, an article in the Financial Times a couple of days ago. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because I have better experts in the room. It just, this article warned that US companies are sitting on a pile of excess cash, right? And what do they do with this excess cash? They put it into securities markets, into bond markets, uh, and in a form of sort of gorilla investment, right? So it's a story about multinational corporations somehow uh, becoming very important uh, players in, in financial markets. Okay. In order to understand, it and understand this and make sense of, of this in a sort of broader context, I want to start from a picture of what I think is a, 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 a nice picture of the welfare state as we, as we think about it in sort of broader terms, right? So the, the definition of a welfare, welfare state, to me, is a collective expression of our collective will to save together and to protect uh, ourselves from the uncertainties of the future, right? This is why we pay taxes, and with these taxes, the state protects us from future uncertainties that have to do with uh, falling ill or with uh, a, um, sort of losing our house. Uh, and in order for us to protect ourselves uh, against these future uncertainties, we pay tax. Okay, so this is the sort of basic idea of the welfare state. But over the la last 30 years, this uh, function of the welf welfare state has been steadily eroded. 
one of the ways in which it, ha it has been steadily eroded is that uh, states around the world have been either unwilling or uh, incapable of taxing multinational corporations. This is why they sit on growing pools of cash that they need to place in, in financial markets. The second phenomena uh, is uh, the, the growing inequality uh, in, uh, in the global economy and the rise of high net worth individuals, another source of uh, 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 cash looking for assets in the, in the global financial economy. 66 trillion US dollars by the, uh, when I look this morning. Uh, because the states have been, uh, have been unable to fund their spending, what we are told is that we have to give up the uh, welfare and protecting ourselves against future uncertainty through the state and instead move towards asset-based welfare. That is, we save through financial markets instead of saving through the state. How do we do that? Well, we save through pension funds, right? Uh, and we also save through insurance companies. So very important, we have these different types of of dynamics in, in financial markets, and these different types of dynamics are generated <coughs> what Andy Haldane called the age of asset management. Right? Asset managers take away uh, the, or take the, the uh, wealth that these different types of institutions have to invest, and they invest them on their behalf. And if you look there, uh, well, you can't see very well, but I'll tell you, uh, in 2016, BlackRock, one of the largest asset, man well, the largest asset managers in the world, is actually much larger than the largest too big to fail global bank. Right? So we are seeing a growing importance of asset managers and uh, a change in the way that our financial systems are, are organized. It's no longer about banks, but it's becoming increasingly about uh, asset management. What does this mean? And this is my attempt to show you this in, in, graphical in graphic terms rather than through complicated numbers, is that we have seen the the growing importance of institutional cash pools. That is, that these different types of, of um, uh, institutions that are active in financial markets, uh, like uh, multinational corporations, high net worth individuals, pension funds, insurance companies, they all collectively pool their cash together in, and uh, create institutional cash pools that are looking for uh, something very special during, types of, during crisis. What do they look for? If you think about yourselves, right, during times of crisis, we typically go, we typically prefer to stay liquid, move out of equity markets and stay, uh, and keep our wealth into a bank deposit to the extent that the state guarantees these bank deposits, right? But these institutional cash pools don't have this uh, option at their disposal because there is a very low deposit guarantee. So you can't, a, a pension fund can't keep much money in a bank deposit because it tends to lose a, a, everything over and above the 100,000 pound deposit guarantee. So what, do, what, what does this phenomena create of the growing institutional cash pools that come from the erosion of the welfare state? They create what central bankers have discussed for the last seven years, which is, or seven to ten years, which is a shortage of safe assets, right? There is no safe assets where to, to park liquidity during times of crisis. And what is the most obvious safe asset and what explains some of the differences between the nominal and market value of public of public debt that Daniel showed you, the most safe asset during times of crisis is public debt, right? In other words, although we hear for the last five, I don't know, ten years in this country, we hear that there is too much public debt, in actually there is too little public debt that, that can meet the demands that come from the financial sector and from the way that we organize our financial sector. And what happens when there is not enough public debt? Well, we have private finance in the financial sector that can generate the kind of innovation that make Private financial instruments look like public debt during good times, but they only do so during good times, during bad times, of course, all this promise of safety disappears. What is the sort of uh, conclusion? Well, we either have to rein in the demand for these safe assets, or we have to increase the supply of these safe assets. In other words, we either increase the amount that the state generates in terms of public debt, or we cut down on the sources of demand. Okay, that is some very radical uh, solutions that are required in terms of improving taxation and rethinking the role of insurance companies and, and pension funds in the financial system. Uh, thank you. Can I, can I ask you a quick question? So, do you think the government should simply just issue more debt and what should we spend that on? You know, should it spend it on state assets, broadband networks, and bridges? Yes. 
I, I've seen in uh, almost all electoral campaigns that the uh, broadband is a big issue. I think that the, 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 some of the implications of this analysis that comes from understanding the changing structures in, in financial markets and the growth of shadow banking are first that states, particularly the UK, can afford to completely abolish tuition fees, to increase spending and to properly nationalize the health system. And on the more radical side, what the state can do uh, is to nationalize pension funds. Right? If, if the source of the problem is that we are increasingly saving through markets rather than through the state, then we have to reduce the sources of save, the, the savings to the market. In other words, the state is always there. Right? It just doesn't look like that in the, in the current arrangement because uh, we have chosen to, to uh, organize our financial system around asset-based welfare. So this is shadow nationalization, is it, the money markets? Well, uh, well no, it would, would be an outright nationalization of pension funds, which uh, incidentally does happen in Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe was pushed to, to uh, create private pension funds, and several countries in Eastern Europe, I don't want to mention their name because their politics is really complicated, I don't want to defend them publicly, but, but they have gone down the route of, of nationalizing pension funds. And, uh, and simply, to me, what, what this analysis says is that the, the footprint of the state can increase in uh, economic activities and in, in provisioning for future uncertainties without any threat of, of uh, public debt crisis. Fascinating. Well, maybe we'll come to why they don't uh, do that in a minute, but thank you. And so, please, can we go next? So I'm going to um, get a lot more generic and talk about something that's dear to my heart. Again, I haven't got very much time. This is another large and complex area. I'm currently on a sabbatical from the Tax Justice Network. I'm writing a new book that is also about money and bad guys, like my last book. But it's, uh, it's, it's a bit more focused on Britain and the domestic consequences of the city of London and things that are going on in the Okay. So uh, I have a bugbear that I've been developing um, in conversation with a few people over many years called the competitiveness agenda. And it's something that I think is one of the great obstacles to reform. Uh, it is something that politicians and other people pull out, lobbyists pull out. It's these, these words, I call them the C words, competitiveness words, competitiveness, competitive, we must compete. Uh, and it's when you apply this word to a country or a jurisdiction or a tax system that we start getting a problem. So if I were to say we must have competitive financial regulation, we must have a competitive tax, corporate tax rate, most people I think in the street, if you said that to them, they would not necessarily, they probably wouldn't have a problem with it. It sounds so reasonable if you haven't actually sat and thought about it. And we must enhance our, our international competitiveness. And you get all these statements coming out. There, there are various variants of, of these words, but David Cameron, we're in a global race today. That's another big thing. We're in a race. It's a sort of anxiety producing um, word. We're, we're going to sink or swim, do or decline. You know, other nations are nipping at our heels. Um, and the answer, of course, is we must look, look, look at our national champions, the multinationals, the bank, and we must give them what they need to compete. Most people, when they hear this word competitiveness, they don't necessarily make these connections. They just think competitiveness sounds good, competitive tax system sounds good. Um, but there are a more specific range of harms that um, come from this, ge this generally powerful tool that, that multinationals and the very wealthy have, the mobile players in our economies. Um, it rewards the big at the expense of the small, so too big to fail banks are likely to be made bigger by this generic process, you're likely to get more e inequality, one of the great defining struggles of our age. Um, more monopolistic practices. Large multinationals are able to kill their smaller competitors in markets on, the factor, on factors that don't have anything really to do with productivity or, or anything like that. They're just able to kill them on, on the fact they're able to extract things better from the state, extract better laws in their, in their favour. And that's one of the um, rather ironic things about this competitiveness. It tends to reduce market competition. Um, they do talk about the tax havens, small tax havens, again and again, when they're debating should we comply with this international regulation, should we crack down on this 
this um, dirty money we've got. The word comes up again. I was at a thing in Panama not so long ago, and they were they were discussing what to do about the Panama Papers, and this word competitiveness, competitividad, was coming up again and again. Uh, we need to protect our financial sector. Um, and you will tend to get, uh, this is a, another matter, but, but lower growth, lower economic growth overall, as well as inequality, or higher inequality, and of course democratic damage, which is a sort of incalculable set of um, harms that jurisdictions suffer when people see larger players getting special privileges that are not available to them. Um, it also tends to have geographical implications inside the United Kingdom because you will tend to get rewards to a certain section of London and the South East. Um, the City of London in particular, um, UK financial services uh, at the expense of the regions uh, where the players, locally based players, find it, find it harder, harder to do business and um, so there is a certain amount of research emerging now that oversized financial sectors can harm your economy as a whole. Finance is good up to a point but once you reach that point and most countries reached that a long time ago you will tend to get um, your economic uh, your economy economic growth will tend to be reduced. Now, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm not going to dwell on this, but if you're interested, there's an interesting um, report that came out of the United States called Overcharge, the High Cost of High Finance, which is a sort of heroic attempt to calculate, put a figure on the damage that um, an oversized financial sector in the United States has on the country. Um, and the good thing about this is that the whole competitiveness agenda all these speeches and pronouncements about we must be competitive rest on, uh, it, they're a house of cards, intellectually, analytically speaking. They don't add up. Um, again, this is a complex area. I'm just going to give you a couple of little, little um, pointers to why the, the, these, are, these rest on basic economic and political fallacies. Um, uh, ponder the difference between when countries, do countries compete with each other, whole countries? Ponder the difference between a failed company and a failed state, just to get a sense of how different these processes we're talking about. Countries do not compete in the same way that companies compete. They're completely different creatures. Um, the competitiveness agenda also rests on the fallacy of composition. In other words, uh, what's good for one sector isn't necessarily good for the country as a whole. And if that sector is extracting wealth from other parts of the economy, uh, and causing other damages, then it may indeed be harmful. So a competitive, um, uh, a comp an overly competitive financial sector may produce all of these harms that outweigh any benefits. And here I'm talking, this is going to be my last point, which is not on a slide. So I mentioned a global race earlier. People talk about a race to the bottom. And in many areas, there are races to the bottom between countries. A country, for example, to take a simple example, you cut your corporate tax rate, other countries follow suit because they're worried about capital flowing out to that country, and you get into a kind of race, and it ends up with a race to the bottom. The traditional standard approach to races to the bottom in international economics is to collaborate for countries to get together and collaborate and cooperate with each other. And that is how, for example, there is a project that the OECD is putting together um, called the BEPS project, which is about uh, trying to rein in the race to the bottom on corporate tax. And it's making heavy weather. And any time you try and do this with a race to the bottom, you're always going to get countries, players, trying to cheat. It's a bit like herding cats. and individual countries trying to gain advantage. It's a very difficult thing to do and it's also quite difficult politically to mobilize constituencies to support certain complicated international <coughs> processes like this. I will argue uh, in my next book, which I'm currently writing, that there's a much simpler, even though I, I think international cooperation and coordination generally is a good idea in these sorts of areas, a much simpler way is to uh, kill the competitiveness agenda, kill the ideology, 
demonstrate that this stuff, even from a purely self-interested national perspective, doesn't help your own country, and indeed it tends to harm your country in so many different areas. Then you can build constituencies that are based purely on national self-interest, and you can start uh, regulating finance as your, as your democracy would demand. You can start taxing corporations and not having to worry about stuff going overseas because your country as a whole will benefit uh, more than it will lose from bringing back democracy. So that's my very generic kind of presentation that emerges out of my work on tax havens, but it applies very much to the UK and many other countries. Well, thank you. Look forward to, to reading I was going to ask um, the devil's advocate here, but I mean, for Ireland, tax competition's worked really well, hasn't it? 12 and percent all the tech companies setting up shop. They've got other assets, like well-educated, English-speaking workforce. Yeah, I've actually got a chapter coming up in my next book, a chapter on Ireland. And Ireland is the poster child for corporate tax cutting. Um, the simple equation goes, Ireland cut its corporate tax rates, and look where it is now, Celtic Tiger boom. Well, there are a lot of things to say to that, but if you look at, I, um, a while ago, put together a graph that looked at Ireland's GNP per capita as a share of the European average, as a percentage of the European average, and plotted it over time. And Ireland started trying to be a tax haven, I think it was in 1956, they started introducing um, tax haven like corporate tax haven like facilities and they kept introducing new ones this graph since then has been flatlining 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 um, similar share of, of you know along with other European countries it's been growing but as a, as compared to them it's been flatlining and then in the early 90s it goes like this what happened in the early 90s um, Ireland joined the single market and Ireland became a platform uh, with access for particularly American multinationals to, uh, to be able to trade in this market of, you know, whatever, 500 million people. And the corporate tax element certainly would have um, changed the attractiveness of, of Ireland at the margin, but if they had had a higher corporate tax rate, if they had extracted higher corporate tax revenues, they would have still got the large majority because it was a friendly English-speaking country uh, with access to the European uh, market, also later on uh, adopting the euro currency. Um, at the same time as this was happening, you had a sudden surge in, in US multinational investment internationally. So all these factors came together. Ireland very, very aggressively marketed itself. So a whole load of things came together at the same, same time. So I'm going to argue that um, despite what everybody thinks that Ireland could be, was corporate taxes that did that created the Celtic Tiger. I'm going to argue that it was actually a different set of stories that created the, the Celtic ti Tiger. And Ireland, um, uh, you know, the corporate taxing is you know, it's a lovely story for the multinationals to tell. Look what happens when you, but the, 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 the reality is somewhere else. Great, thanks. So Richard will finish our talk for this evening. Will, I have one slide. Do you know where it is? Thank you. It's not. It's somewhere on here. Uh, my job is apparently um, get you interested in... Um... Oh, now you've got rid of my one slide. That was it. There we go. That's it. My one and only slide. Um, to um, encourage you to participate with some ideas. Um, so I'll start by saying I agree. There we are. That's my summary. Look, do I agree? Why do I agree that we have assets overvalued? This is the chart for the worldwide stock and share index from Tuesday of this week. It is at a record high. The worldwide index, so it's not one country, this is all over the place. And look at those previous highs. Uh, you have 31st December 1999, uh, after which, of course, it fell off a cliff. And you have 10 years ago, after which, of course, it fell off a cliff. And now we're on the top of the cliff. Where do you think it's going next? Um, I think I'm fairly safe in predicting, um, as I have done um, for some time, that it is inevitably going to collapse. And it will go back to somewhere around that bottom line 
Yeah, because that seems to be where it goes. So assets are undoubtedly overvalued, but not just government stock, but also shares as well. And just to add into the scenario, I would mention that house prices and land prices in many countries are also at extraordinary highs, quite out of proportion to anything that most people, well, anyone who hasn't got grey hair anyway, can possibly think about buying anymore. Um, so we are in a, an economy that is well and truly blown apart by overvaluation. It makes no sense. I mean, let's just look at why it makes no sense. Let's start with Hurricane Irma. Yeah. Something serious is going on with the world's climate. Global warming is happening. We have growing inequality. We have Brexit, I will mention it. It is obviously going to be massively disruptive in a way that we have not even imagined yet for many states. We have Trump, who could still be more disruptive than any of us have dared imagine yet. We have continuing austerity. We have massive shortages of government debt to meet needs, as Daniela says. We clearly are short of some types of government debt, and when we have very obvious overvaluation of assets arising at the same time. We have enormous personal debts, and that indicates, and I entirely agree, that this is obviously a sign of massive inequality. Because debt, I'm an accountant. For every debt, there is a credit. It doesn't matter which side you're on the equation. Somebody has to owe somebody else, by definition. And that is the crisis we face, inequality. And yet it's not the whole crisis, of course, and I entirely agree, again, that we can look at the charts, we can look at the numbers, but actually, what actually happened 10 years ago today? I'll make an uncontroversial comment, because I'm good at those. Um, Neoliberalism died. We just have yet to bury it. I mean, it quite clearly failed. There was the end of the dream, but in the decade since then, those who had the dream have refused to wake up and accept the reality that it should be dead, buried and gone. So we have that fight, and we have denial of the truth as an ongoing situation. As a result of this, I put up a letter from the Bank of England on my blog this morning. Um, it was deliberately timed for this morning to coincide with speaking tonight on this issue. That there was a letter that somebody had written to the Bank of England saying, Do you create money? Is it true that the, what this chap Richard Murphy says, that you create money on behalf of the government? And the Bank of England wrote back to the person who had corresponded with them, quoting me, saying, no, we do not create government. Oh, uh, we do not create money for the benefit of the government. So I then put up a quote from the Bank of England's website, which says, we have done quantitative easing, we have created £435 billion pounds of money, but apparently we haven't, according to this reply to somebody. No, we are in complete denial of the truth, and that wasn't used to fund the government except that the Bank of England owns £435 billion pounds worth of government debt. That is enough to fund the entire deficit from 2012 to 2016. It is also a reason why there's a shortage of government debt, because the government owns one quarter of it, and it is one of the corporate lies it is made to sustain the appearance that we have functioning markets when we don't, because there isn't a functioning market in debt. One of the reasons why the price is so high is the government keeps on buying it. It's one of the reasons why the Nikkei is so high in Japan. 60% of the Nikkei index in Japan is owned by the Bank of Japan. There isn't a functioning stock market in Japan anymore. Most Japanese industry is now nationalized by default. Um, and we have this pretense that the market continues in operation when it doesn't. We have a pretense that we have GDP, we have debt in the UK of 88% of GDP, government debt, when it isn't true because you can't own yourself money. Just think about it, if you have a mortgage and you owned your own mortgage, how burdensome would the payment be? I'm gonna pay it out of my left pocket and into my right pocket. That's about how hard paying the debt will be if you own your own debt, but that's what the UK government does with 25% of its debt. So we first of all have a pretense that there is a market system still existing when it isn't, which is supported by apparent massive success because of asset prices rising, which is all taking place because of a denial that the only reason that asset prices are rising is because governments are basically doing their very best to support them. And yeah, the tax system does that as well. Why are pension funds so overvalued? Because the UK 
subsidises, I'll use the UK as an example, subsidises pension funds by something like £80 billion pounds a year with tax reliefs. That is not the figure you'll see on HM Revenue and Customs website because that is another lie. Sorry, I'm using the word lie quite happily today and anybody can see me because I can defend my facts, I really don't mind. Um, the figures are simply misstated, deliberately misstated. And so we give this massive subsidy to wealth inequality through the tax system, through the, tax, uh, through the pension subsidies every year. It's a nonsense. So what can we do about this? First of all, we need to recognise that there must be a new political narrative. The political narratives we have are dead. There is no private sector solution to this problem, because private sector solutions, neoliberal style capital solutions, have created inequality. And the private sector has no answer to the pension crisis. <coughs> and the pension crisis is real. There are too many people with this colour hair right now who are hoping to continue for a long time. And not everybody has nominated their retirement age as I have to my university as being 83. <laughs> that is my chosen retirement age, only because that's when my father began to slow down and dad's 91 and still going well. Um, but, you know, that's unusual. Lots of people want to retire for a very long time. The pension industry, as Daniela has just said, is based entirely on these massive overvaluations. And boy, are we going to have some big pension deficits soon. And they are going to be so big that nobody's going to know how to deal with them. Because we have ignored for a very long time the real pension uh, equation. The real pension equation is we have to build assets sufficient during our lifetime for the next generation to give up their income to support us in our old age. These are real assets. They are roads, they are broadband, they are hospitals, they are real businesses. They're not stocks and shares, which are a complete phony asset. None of that money in that stock index actually funds real investment. We have to make real investment. That was the basis of my proposal, which was indeed picked up by Jeremy Corbyn, for people's quantitative easing. It is virtually unrelated to quantitative easing, because quantitative easing is a monetary exercise, and people's quantitative easing is a fiscal exercise. It is intended to deliberately create new, solid, tangible assets which create jobs, which create employment in every constituency in the country, which create a new green, sustainable economy, because I'm also an author of the Green New Deal, and which would then deliver the fiscal transformation of growth based upon people actually being in work and paying tax, which would then rebalance the economy and redistribute, as you have suggested from those with wealth, to those who need to spend, which most people in this country need to do because they're making it very difficult for people to make ends meet, in my experience. So this is a radical re-transformation of the way in which the economy works based upon real investment and shattering this market-based system. But it requires people to accept a new consensus. It cannot, by the way, be a pure left-wing consensus either. There is no state solution in its isolation either. I believe we have a mixed economy. I believe we should have a mixed economy, and I think we need a mixed economy. I'm often accused of being a radical left winger, and I often say, yeah, look at my CV. Senior partner of firm of accountants, founder of 10 entrepreneurial companies, 2 dot coms, and God knows what else. I'm quite happy to own up to all those things, and yeah, I'm a lefty. I don't care about admitting that either. Those things are completely compatible. Markets work with good, strong regulation and really progressive taxation. They are the foundations of strong, stable markets. We need that combination to build what I call the cappuccino economy. I'm going to finish on that. It wasn't where I expected to go. But what is the cappuccino economy? I never expected to know where I'm going to end up. That's not in my notes. <laughs> the cappuccino economy, the cup is the state. The espresso is government the foundation of the product. The frothy milk is the private sector. And the sprinkles on the top are the Sunday Times colour supplement, or the observed colour supplement, if you wish. I'd be fair here. <laughs> the thing that makes you believe that the private sector makes everything good and glossy in life. Actually, when you drink a cappuccino, I hate this stuff, but I'm told that when you drink a cappuccino, you mix the three components together. You try having the sprinkles without the hot milk or the black coffee. They are, by the time you get them, one mixture. 
That is what is going to make our future. There isn't a pure state solution. There is most definitely not a competition-only private sector solution. We have to go back and say, we will work in partnership between state, private sector, individual communities, and put together the foundations for an economy which is strong because all of those elements are allowed to function in harmony one with another. Is that possible? Yes. Did it happen? Yes. 1948 to 1973, near as damn it. Did it work? Undoubtedly. The best period that capitalism has ever delivered was actually when the state was really proactive. The answer in that time was we did not have such a massive overinflated asset value. We instead built the economy. Remember, when the NHS was founded, UK national debt was 250% of GDP. Did it stop anyone starting the NHS? No. We need to have that same courage now. Thank you very much. Uh, the audience asks questions now. Um, who'd like to go first? Yes, please. Um, just first point. That does represent real investment because companies do invest, but I accept that. But not else. using share capital, they don't. But nevertheless, it's, 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 companies do invest. So but not using share capital, that's my point. They borrow debt. Well, they, oh, when they share, they do. But fair enough. That's a bubble. That, that's true. Um, question was. Um, how are we going to redistribute wealth when that wealth is fantasy? When that wealth is fantasy. Currently, we have fantasy wealth. That's what that, all that debt means. So, how are we going to redistribute it? Well, obviously, one way to redistribute it is have a mighty big bank. That's going to be very uncomfortable. And obviously, one of the realities is that we may have that mighty big bang, and some of this wealth will obviously disappear in the process. What we will then need to do is have the process of the government being willing to step up and play its role when that bang happens. That was why I created the idea of people's quantitative easing. It's why they have to be ready to go. I mean, one of the things that I was accused of um, two years ago when I had an interesting summer when Jeremy Corbyn did borrow my ideas was that everyone said, well, we don't need people's QE now because we're doing nicely as an economy. I said, this idea is created for when we need it. We are going to need the government to be willing to march into the economy, have a national bank, investment bank that's ready to go, that will invest street by street, road by road, etc., on projects which will put people to work right across the country, because that's how you redistribute. You actually keep people at work. You fail to redistribute when you let people go out of work, as happened in the 1920s, 1930s, because there was a financial crisis and nobody was willing to step, to step in fill that gap and keep people working. I think there is a lot to be said for you know, quite a few of the things that we've heard. Um, you have heard both from Daniela and from Richard that maybe you know all this debt mount is actually not bad, but might actually be quite good if it's you know bought by the right people and used to the right ends. And on some level, I think there is some truth in that. Having said that, I think Financial crises, historically, are valuation crises. Where valuations of assets are out of whack. And then, if you consider the financial system only, when the value correction sets in, that's when the chips come falling down. And I think that is something that you do have to keep in mind. You know, that in principle say, well, why can't the Bank of England just print money and give it to the government for it to build new roads? I, I think that's an argument that we can have for the moment. In 2017, I think there is a little bit of caution and order when we think about you know many of the things that were mentioned about the assets that pension funds own, what's going to happen to them when we see a great correction and real interest rates going back to where they belong historically, I think it's still something that I'm a little bit afraid of. You've seen companies like Aviva calling for more state projects to invest in. So why, why this reluctance to do it, in your view? Um, well, I mean, just to discuss the UK, to me, there is the, the, sort of the politics of why we think the state should not uh, intervene in, in any kind of economic activity comes from sort of very straightforward politics and mm -hmm. the way that we understand what has happened since 2008 in the UK in terms of the crisis and the management of it. And the way that I see it is that uh, the Tories were, uh, the Tory party was very good at selling a, a political narrative that said the Labour mishandled the economy, uh, look at the amount, the growth in public debt, we will do it better. And, uh, and this narrative captured the, uh, the attention of the public because it, on some level it, it's kind of intuitive, right? They say, well, 
the state is like a household, if it's spent beyond its means, then obviously we have a problem. Well, we economists know that that's a fallacy, the state is not like a household. So first, it has a central bank, and I think I would disagree a little bit with Daniel, because if we look at what's happened in the UK since 2008, the central bank has been printing money, has been printing money to help the government. I mean, this is what QE does, it monetizes public debt. Whether we like to call it that or not, it's a, it's a different conversation, but what, what we thought before the crisis is an essential period of central bank independence, that you don't, you don't buy government and you don't print money to that extent, that's not, no longer true. I mean, it doesn't hold in, 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 in practice of the, and in the way that the balance sheet is organized. How do you change the political narrative? I'm not sure. I don't know if the cappuccino economy is, is the right narrative. It sounds to me like a very middle class kind of a <laughs> solution. <laughs> I'll go for something more basic, uh, probably. I don't know if class war. Uh, I think class war is, uh, is in some ways easier. But I think and, and uh, what, I, what I saw in this uh, recent election is that uh, the Labour Party has to kind of slowly, or has slowly and gradually uh, sort of uh, fought back at this uh, narrative that we, we, the Tory party, are better at, at hand, handling the economy. Because that's not true. I mean, in practice, if you look at what's happened since 2008 on, with austerity, that's not true on many, many fronts. I'm, I'm, I'm from Romania, and I lived in many poor countries, and it is striking to me that there are one in seven children in the UK are going to, 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 into the, to the school in the morning without having had breakfast, because they, they can't afford to have it. That, that to me, uh, I, I came here as a migrant for some at the beginning thinking, well, this is a kind of high, um, high income country, everything will be rosier here. Well, it's, uh, it's very strange that that's not the case. And, and it comes from a political ideology of, that doesn't really engage with the economic realities of both how an economy works and, and how our global finance is structured. So uh, slowly and with, with education, maybe not with the cappuccino economy, but uh, maybe Richard is better at, uh, at promoting that message than, than we are. We economists are at saying, well, austerity is not the right idea and, and there is no danger in having public debt. And the difference in, in valuations that uh, Daniel showed you, can, they can, you can look at them as simply an expression of the flight to safety. During crisis, everybody runs away from a crisis of valuation in, in securitization or private asset markets. They all run into government bonds, obviously, if there is such a high demand prices go. Very simple supply and demand to me. Uh, that doesn't mean a very big correction afterward. So That's there is a magic money tree. Of course there is a yeah. magic tree. We are very close to it. It's on St. Peter Street, the Bank of England. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, thank you. First, I'd like to thank all the speakers for the challenging talks. Um, I put a question, really, for everybody. There's a general acceptance that somehow it's, I feel, natural for these huge sums of money floating all across the financial universe. And we've got to get away, find lots of ways of manipulating this and getting it right. Surely these huge surpluses are of themselves completely unnatural and the real underlying causes of the problems that you have all been addressing quite different but very interesting ways. Nick? Yeah, so I, I'm going to kind of float a balloon here, this is really another whole subject, but um, does it, did anybody read a story, in, it originally was in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago, about Google and the New America Foundation? Anybody read that? Mm, yeah. So, there's a, there, the New America Foundation had a group of people in there, radical activists, but neither left-wingers nor right-wingers, they were just... Um, very, very concerned with the problem of monopoly. And th there is something very interesting emerging in the United States right now. So they welcomed a European fine on Google. They issued a statement saying this 2.6 billion fine on Google for its anti-competitive practices is just what we need. Google leaned on the New American Foundation and had these guys sacked. And these are the kind of leading lights in the US anti-monopoly movement. Now, I think my prediction is in the next 10 years, anti-monopoly, anti-trust is going to be uh, the next big thing. I think, uh, in, particularly inside the Democratic Party in the United States, there is this big fight going on right now. And I'm just talking the last six months to a year. People are waking up, they're going back to the old histories of anti-monopoly, back to Standard Oil and the big money trusts and, uh, and, and something really exciting is emerging in the United States. And I have been looking around in, U in Britain and in Europe 
for any kind of civil society equivalent to this movement that's now just this germ of a movement that's starting to emerge in, in, in the United States. And I haven't seen anything, um, if anybody is aware of anything going on, but I think we are all asleep on this issue. This is absolutely gigantic. And this is one of the other reasons for these huge cash surfaces, because corporations are able to extract wealth from consumers, from their workers, from taxpayers, from everybody. Uh, and, um, and it's imbalancing our, our economies in an, in an absolutely enormous way. Um, and I think, uh, you know, something like, you know, I've been working with the Tax Justice Network, which has kind of been creating, it's, it, it's the combination of radicalism and expertise in this complicated area has kind of punched open space for lots of people to enter. And I think um, something like this is now needed in the field of monopolies. I think we need a, a radical but expert group coming in and doing something in Britain, in Europe, to start opening up this space and questioning the very fundamental philosophy that is being, um, that governs anti-monopoly law in Britain and, and the European Union, um, and that kind of got corrupted in, in, in the 60s and the 70s with people like Robert Bork and, and all sorts of maniacs who, who from the Chicago School who, um, who basically destroyed US antitrust. Um, so I um, cutting through to essential issues sometimes just requires a, a great thinker. Um, and obviously in the past, and we still refer to some of those great thinkers <coughs> in the past. And so we have Keynes who fought for us for a generation, and Hayek may have done it um, for a following generation. My fear is that when information is so overwhelming and so saturated, um, there is a dilution effect in terms of cutting through from a great thinker. Now, I'm not saying that Piketty's 2014 book is that book, but it certainly is a book that says something quite clear, and even though it's a large book, it says it quite simply. And I just wonder whether there is just too much pride amongst those who want to change things, that they don't effectively all um, converge um, onto one great thinker's idea as a way to change things. Because I agree with you, sir. Um, there isn't that political um, appetite or within the electorate at large. But I just wonder if that's actually because um, people who are all well-meaning come at too many nuances to this question um, and don't cut through to the essentials. I think the electorates of the past actually understood quite clearly what someone like a Keynes or a Hayek meant and could actually embrace it. I'm just not sure the electorate can do that with the complexity of the way things are presented in such a nuanced and elaborate manner. Richard, can you embrace Piketty? I can embrace Piketty. I haven't physically. <laughs> I've met the man, but we've not embraced. Um, <laughs> Yes, of course I can embrace Piketty, and uh, there's a lot of merit in what Piketty has said. Let's you know, not deny it. I just wish it had a good editor. It didn't need 700 pages. Um, that apart, I think that there was, you know, he's clearly important. Is he the great thinker? No, I don't think so. Not by himself. Do we have a great thinker of that style at the moment? No, probably not. Um, but I'm not sure that we need a great thinker in that pure economic sense either because actually we have seen the ability of people to excite particular audiences and countries and I think that it's not true, I mean Germany is not a good example here I'm afraid um, you know, Corbyn has done something quite unusual, I mean I in part got the man wrong, you know I, I've known him for a long time and I supported him and then I just found John McDonald just not left wing enough. Um, that was his trouble. Um, well, he wanted to sign up to George Osborne's fiscal charter, which made it kind of difficult for me to work for him. Um, and then he changed his mind. Um, but, you know, that's life. Um, but he has excited an audience. And he did pull people out. And there was an unusual electoral result as well. And then next week I'll be in Scotland, which is a country which is... And it is a country. Which is extraordinarily different from England and I want to make that point very strongly, where there is an enormous um, political excitement about things which really do not get people worked up here. I mean, the composition of Scottish national accounts has put me twice on the front page of newspapers in the last month in Scotland, 
discussing national income accounting is a really big deal in Scotland. And I'm up there to talk about it in the Parliament next week. And this matters because it's around a much bigger understanding of who they are as a people. And the thing that's going to change this is not just one bright economist or political theorist or scientist, whatever, who's going to come up with a single idea, but it's actually about exciting people who have been very unexcited and quite deliberately unexcited because neoliberalism has deliberately pushed them out. You know, for something which claims it's competitive, it's totally intolerant of all ideas but its own, um, those people have been deliberately pushed outside the political domain. Once they can be brought back into the political domain and told that there are reasons for engaging, whether it is because you may actually have access to housing or education or debt-free student education or whatever else, which ticks boxes, people will re-engage. In the case of Scotland, yeah, the idea that it might be a nation or might not be separate is enough to excite people. And I think it's much more than pure economics. But if I want one idea, which is actually also in economics that's going to excite people, people, it is the flip side of taxation, and that's the magic money trick. Because as I argue in The Joy of Tax, tax and money are just flip sides of each other. Um, you know, I often show to audiences that you, know, you cannot pay um, tax until the government has printed one of these. You know, you simply can't do it. Because if there isn't any of that, that available, and the government demands you pay in this, well, it doesn't exist to pay it. And what happens when you tax is ever so simple. Look, that's it. That's what happens when you tax. You destroy money. Why do we have tax? We don't have tax to pay for... Um, to, Tesco's taken when they're taken to together, I promise you. Um, <laughs> it's the second one I've got in my wallet to already do. Uh, there's another one here, already torn up. Um, so, I mean, I do this quite often. Um, I practice at sewing the uh, um, It's going to be harder with the plastic now. Yeah, yeah, it's so annoying. I have to do 20 quid notes now. I mean, sometime soon I'm going to have to use 50 quid notes, and they're really hard to find. But the point is that the only reason for tax is, in fact, to control inflation. Government prints all the money it needs to generate. Once we begin to understand that there is no tax constraint on spending, and it's all about the object of creating full employment for the benefit of people in society, which is what modern monetary theory is largely about, then I think we have a total liberated situation and we see tax is then an instrument of social policy including redistribution which is its real purpose then we actually move to a totally different economic model that I think is where the excitement will eventually arise so great thinkers anyone like to nominate a great thinker of our age hmm. a man who tears up 20 quid notes <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it kind of ruins, when you, when you say you can take it to Tesco, it kind of ruins the whole... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, wouldn't say it, but... yeah, I don't know, I, I, maybe not about, I don't, want it to, I don't want to make it about great thinkers, but I've been thinking for a while of what, I mean, what is our role, as, for example, as academics in the system, right? And how do, we, how do we make sure that it goes beyond sort of educating um, young students, although I think that's important. And, and I think a, an interesting insight that I have from a couple of... Uh, Greek anarchist friends, they always tell me, well, we'll also come for you when the revolution comes, right? Because you have a stake in the system and you're not prepared to take very radical uh, steps to change it. And I think to some extent that's true. I mean, I would ask everybody in this room to think, are we really prepared to, to change it, for the system to change radically? Have we ever thought what it means to get away from all this uh, sort of bubble of finan financial um, transactions uh, on top of each other? And I, I don't have an answer. I think it's, it, it's quite a difficult question. Um, how do we change and, and, and what kind of radical change is possible and why do we expect it from the electorate when we can't really contemplate it properly. Uh, maybe we just need the context to be very different. When Keynes, I mean, we have to remember Keynes came from the elite and he had some ideas that made it into policy because they were also uh, the, the, the ideas of, of, an, of the elite. Uh, and war. And, and war, yes, yes. Well, who knows, maybe that's what we're getting. Uh, direct, uh, direct. Well, actually, I share the diagnosis that there is a fracturing of the public debate um, in a way that's unhealthy to build support for policies that you know are carried by the population as a whole. And I also think what you see is there is a fracturing of narratives, as it were. You know, there are many more pet concerns that are now discussed in small circles, but people get really fired up. Uh, you know, often for good reasons, you know, about all sorts of issues, but for them, you know, they can spend all their political energy and anger on this one issue, whether it's 
animals, you know, and I'm all in favor of animal welfare, but you know, you know, there is in the Netherlands we have a party for the animals, we have a party for people who are 50 and over, we have a party for this, that, and the other. I think right now we have 12 parties in the parliament or something like that. And you know, that is something that our electoral system allows, but you can see if there is scope for those centrifugal political forces, you know, combined with Twitter and all these things, Twitter and other kind. I think it's very hard to build sort of like a society spanning narrative in the way that you know mass parties as we used to know them used to do. I think in most of the countries you mentioned there's obviously a lot to say about whether the United Kingdom and the United States are the norm or whether they're the outliers. You know, I think they're the outliers, but they have electoral systems that support a small number of political parties. They're you know century pedal fortress that push people back to these parties. But I think take that away and people are you know, certainly sort of the middle classes are just about well off enough, but they're quite happy to support their pet interests and kind of disengage uh, from these bigger questions. Until their pensions plan. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Man in Cheshire. Thank you um, very much for some really good presentations. Uh, There's uh, really so much to go at, but uh, um, in, in a good way. Uh, a lot to discuss. I want, I want to make sort of two points that are kind of, that are kind of related. Um, one is picking up on um, Richard's point about the, um, the QE and how you know, the state has, has both issued guilt and has, and has bought them as well. Uh, it's a mystery to me why you know, these aren't both just struck off the balance sheet and our, our real uh, debt GDP ratio is more like 60% than 90%. Um, but um, I, I, I do wonder why there isn't a vision to do something like that and, and, and give a true picture and then the, why there isn't a vision for the, the, the government and the state, the politicians to invest in our infrastructure to, to use a cappuccino analogy the state provides the infrastructure upon which the rest of the economy and all our, our welfare sits and I don't understand why they don't have the vision to do that there's so much to go at electrification you know, of, of, of transport you know, with roads, we need a network of electric points so we can electrify our cars and so on. And only the state can, can do that sort of thing. We've talked about education, we've talked about the health service, we've talked about green economy. There's so much to go at, and it's real assets that we need to get in there, which comes back to the overvaluation point. And so, so my, my second general point is that what seems to lay behind an awful lot of the problems we've got is that there's so much money sloshing around. And it doesn't go into generating new real assets at all. It's going to buy existing assets. We've got James Murdoch uh, today you know, grumbling about being referred because he's talking about investing in the country. He's just talking about buying another asset, buying another existing asset. That's not new investment at all. And so, you know, so what, what we've found is this money is it's going, it's going into, into existing companies or, 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 or um, bonds or shares or property and all that sort of thing. It's inflating those. And we need to find a mechanism, it seems to me, to reduce the, um, uh, the, the tendency for new money to just pile into existing assets and find a way to encourage it to go into generating new assets. And we seem to have lost the ability to do that. So what is that mechanism? Yeah. Maybe I can pick up the second one uh, in the spirit of Keynes, right? The, 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 in sort of Keynesian understanding, uh, Multinationals or, or corporations don't invest in real assets because they don't have very good expectations of future profits. You don't have good expectations of future profits because you live in a country where there is austerity, where real wages are, are falling, and therefore it doesn't make sense to create to create new supply when there is, there is not enough source of, sources of demand. So the mechanism, I mean, the, the solutions are obvious: uh, higher higher minimum wages, higher wages in general. Uh, and uh, more government spending that generates aggregate demand. Why you don't get that in the first place, then it's a question to me of, of politics and political ideology. Because one, the parties are on the right, they want the market to, to provide these solutions, they can't during crisis, they usually mar private markets don't generate aggregate demand during bad times, uh, and the left, part, the left parties we have in this country are kind of still uh, sort of wedded to a narrative of we need to cost everything, and we need to prove the public that we are uh, capable of handling economics. Yeah. One, a national investment bank, funded by people's quantitative easing issued to pension funds. Two, let's make a simple requirement on pension funds. We give them this massive subsidy. Why don't we require that 
just 20% of all their contributions received a year were invested into a new employment generating opportunity inside the UK economy. It would be transformational in the level of actual, real, tangible investment. So if you want the tax relief, you must ensure that part of your investment goes into new asset creation, not just speculation. You can have a pension fund which doesn't attract tax relief after all. It's perfectly okay. It's just called savings, by the way. That's all it is. Um, and you don't need a tax um, subsidy to create savings. The world is absolutely awash with them. But if you want a tax relief, you have to spend it in a directive fashion. I just can't see the problem. Next question. There's a lady here. I'm running over this question of how can we avoid another crisis, and I'm just wondering if we are missing the crisis that is actually under our nose. Because it strikes me that um, by looking around for financial crisis, we are completely failing to see a political crisis, which was, uh, which is currently going on in both the UK and the US concurrently, and it's no accident to my mind that uh, those are the two countries that were the epicenter of the financial crisis. So I'm just wondering if we need to define this a little more broadly, because there's some questions that came from the room about why we appear to lack the vision to do what you know, some of us so clearly think is necessary. And I wonder if that it is actually because we have this sort of melting pot in the political realm and, and needing to look for the emergence of a new political paradigm and a radical transformative reordering of society, much more radical than we've been discussing. Do you have anything specific in mind? Um, I'm, well, I, as the panel probably know, I'm a fairly ardent promoter of basic income and wealth taxation for starters. The two together, by the way. Yes. Anybody else? Yes. The lady at the front, please. Just kind of on a similar note, um, Richard, you mentioned the Green New Deal in passing, but it seems to me that if we're talking about a crisis, no one's mentioned the environmental crisis we're facing, and that I don't really see how we can talk about any of that without putting it in this context too. And if we're going to wish for a, a different kind of future, um, that seems to me it needs to be very much part of what we're talking about as well. 2002 was an interesting year in my life. I met John Christensen, that was a mistake. <laughs> it's okay, mate. And I met Colin Hines, who I happened to be with earlier this afternoon, and then with him I uh, helped create the Green New Deal, and I've always told Colin he was a mistake. Um, you know, these two people transformed my life and made me a campaigner, and I don't really regret a moment with either, let's be totally honest. Um, the Green New Deal, quite deliberately, is a... Keynesian anti-cyclical investment strategy designed to actually create jobs in every constituency to tackle the environmental crisis. And if you want to put the environmental crisis in a nutshell, it is that over 50% of houses in the UK are still uninsulated. Not badly insulated, uninsulated. There are vast numbers that do not have double glazing. They don't even have any insulation in the loft at all. There's no you know, attempt to put a solar panel on their roofs. Um, yeah, we are just so far away from turning every building in this country into a power station, and yet we could. I mean, we are so far behind Germany and other countries on you know, the ability to create solar energy and others. Um, our recycling efforts are still paltry. And yet, if we did this properly, we could create vast numbers of jobs um, for a long period of time with skills and opportunity, with apprenticeships that would be meaningful. People would be at work on high levels of pay. The rate of return is enormous, particularly at a time when we're energy dependent, and therefore we can support the value of the pound by doing this. Bluntly, on the foreign exchange markets, this would be a great benefit to us as an import substitution technology. And we could print the money to do it. What is the problem? I wish I knew. I wish I knew. Lobbying. This gentleman here at the front. Um, one of the major issues with the financial crisis is that there's a global financial crisis that was in 2008. Um, and what you seem to be suggesting all the time is, is a solution to the UK crisis, which may shield the UK from whatever global crisis. But from a philosophical point of view, I don't want to see people in the rest of Europe, in China and India, suffering as a, as a result of a global crisis. So do you have any solutions to a more kind of global mechanism for preventing the next global crash? 
It's an interesting point, actually. Okay. I mean, is, is the next crash going to be global? You know, would it, would it be more one, one would assume so, yes. I mean, I, I think certainly Richard and I have spent a long time talking about tax havens and the international offshore system. That's clearly a big part of the issue. And one of the themes of Treasure Islands was that the UK itself has offshore characteristics. I'm not, just, I'm not just talking about tax, I'm talking about Wall Street banks coming over here and other banks from other parts of the world coming over here or going to Dublin and doing things they weren't allowed to do at home, um, safety mechanisms that were put in place, you could escape them by going offshore. So I think um, I think the UK as, as arguably the biggest player in the offshore system um, has, a, has a big role to play. Um, in, in addressing global issues. Um, capital flight out of Africa, illicit financial flows, these sorts of things very much run through, substantially through UK territories. Um, a lot of big European tax havens like Luxembourg and Switzerland and Ireland, um, I think there is room for, room for, for work there. I, I think it, it is a bit like a hydra, it is, you know, you cut off one head and, and there are other heads that will do stuff and so you're never going to be able to solve the problems. But I think I go back again to the idea that actually the, the most fundamental thing to do is to kill the ideology that has lain behind all of that. Um, you're always going to get money lobbying and being powerful and pushing for what it wants, but money um, goes hand in hand, hand with ideology. And I think if we do get... Um, when the financial crisis came, nobody was ready really with a new coherent set of ideologies. Um, and, and ways of thinking about the state and markets and things. Um, so it was kind of a crisis that went to waste. I think as and when the next one comes, um, I think there are a lot more people who are awake with answers and things to do. So I think, I think you know, it's not hopeless. Um, I would also go back to uh, Francis' point about um, basic income. I think that's something that we does everybody know what that is. Um, I think that is another very, uh, very fundamental um, exercise. Again, it's something that kind of needs to be implemented on a national level, but once it becomes accepted, once the idea becomes accepted, um, it's something that's been around for, for quite a long time. I used to uh, write about it. I used to write about oil producing countries, and I always saw a kind of, saw it in political terms, this, this solution. Um, because you have a, a kind of triangle, you have the oil companies, you have the governments, and you have the people. And for a long time, the oil companies, in terms of power, were at the top. And um, the governments were sort of down there somewhere, and the people were right at the bottom. And then you have OPEC coming along, and that kind of pushed the governments up. Up this triangle, but the people stayed down at the bottom. I think if you had a radical redistribution of oil revenues, which is a kind of related concept to, to basic income, you would politically, you would turn that triangle again and you would get people coming up. Um, uh, so I think it's politically very important as well as economically. I just wanted to kind of re-flag that in case it got lost. I want to bring up a couple of things which have been recurring themes in the tax justice world for a long time. You know, one is that we do need a world tax authority. I mean, let's be just straightforward and clear about it. We have to coordinate um, global capitalism, or the fight against global capitalism has to be coordinated. Global capitalism is set up to fight taxation. Um, you know, that is why we have tax havens. Let's not pretend they're the, you know, the oil, put the oil in the motion of international capitalism. They're just the aircraft carriers used to launch an attack on democracy and our right to collect tax. That's what they're there for. That's what they do. Um, and it requires coordination to deliver that. And I think that awareness is growing. It's not there. In fact, they might move to qualified majority voting to make sure that Ireland can't get its way and veto everything on taxation and so on. That's welcome. It moves in the right direction. So let's not pretend there's no science, even if it was Juncker, you know, the former Prime Minister and the ultimate tax haven operator as the Prime Minister of um, Luxembourg for many years who said it. I mean, the OECD has done some good work. I mean, let's not pretend we haven't made progress at the OECD. Because you know, we actively engaged with the BEPS process as much as we also criticise it. You know, I do remember a morning when um, Sol Picciotto of Tax Justice Network and I were sitting in a room with 40 countries. There were basically the two of us and 40 countries in a room discussing country by country reporting. And we apparently represented the rest of the world. And I whispered to Sol, who gave us the authority to represent the rest of the world? Um, I didn't know. And yet civil society was there. 
and we did get it, and we won it. We won country by country reporting against this enormous lobbying exercise. And I assure you, it was enormous and very costly, even in those same rooms when business met the OECD. So progress is possible, but it does require really good ideas. And you know, I hate to say it, but country by country reporting well, probably was quite a good idea in its own way. I think basic income is, but John and I went for a long walk um, in May this year, and we tramped across the north of Norfolk, and it was a very interesting discussion we had on that walk. Going for a long walk is always a good way to put the world to the right. And we talked about basic income on that walk, if you remember, John. And one of the ideas we talked about was that it wasn't basic income, perhaps it was something more than that. It was basic capital. Because one of the things that everyone says about basic income is that everyone will sit down on their backsides and never do anything ever again if they have a basic income. Now, I don't believe that. I believe that most people really want to do quite exciting and interesting things in their lives. And what you view basic income as is the capital that liberates them to go out and take the risk to do something really interesting and exciting and maybe create their own business, create their own idea, pursue their own dream. Turn the whole idea of it on its head, give them the money to go and actually do that really exciting thing. And I believe we could have a new generation of opportunity flower in front of us. Yeah, I love this idea. We're together on this one, Francis. <laughs> Daniel, I, I will just descend then. I wanted to say that uh, I, I think that some of the dynamics that I described are global, right, in terms of these institutional cash flows and demand for safety and they need global solutions. Uh, there is a fa fatigue about uh, creating new sort of regulatory regimes and there is a lot of powerful lobbying. But what I've seen, for example, from the process of the European financial transactions tax is what uh, Richard just described, when civil society sits in the room, things look a little bit different and the lobbying power of, of the financial sector can be fought against. I mean, not in the, in the case of the financial transactions tax, only temporary uh, sort of victories, but, but this is possible. Uh, however, I wonder, the, I, I know basic income is uh, some, somehow a magical solution to all the problems of uh, financial capitalism. I disagree for one reason, because I'm wondering why Silicon Valley is so keen on embracing it. Why are they pushing it so much? And when I start to ask myself that question, I'm starting to think about rolling back, for example, uh, workers' rights, or rolling back other forms of unionizing or, or working together and protecting ourselves against uh, the forces of, of, of capital or, or, or employers in some way or another. So I, I think that it's, it's the, uh, the well intentions that are powering this idea of basic income can be very quickly captured uh, if, if Silicon Valley is behind it. Otherwise, I don't. But, but Francis, uh, maybe you can illuminate us on why Silicon Valley w wants it and when we shouldn't worry. Do you have some thoughts, Francis? Yeah, I do actually, because I you know quite a lot about this. In fact, I mean, have you read the RSA's paper? No, I haven't. So this, <laughs> this institution, this institution, Francis, would you yeah. introduce yourself to the yeah, room? Yeah, I'm just Francis Cotner, I'm writer, and I'm speaking earlier today on Saturday. Um, this institution here, RSA, is a major component of at universal basic income. We've done a lot of research on it and um, have a uh, research on cost in model and so forth as well, but well worth looking at. Um, I, I think, Daniela, I mean, you're right to be concerned. Yeah. You know, I have some concerns about some of the, um, some of the um, actors who are interested in basic income and their motives. Um, I'm, so the biggest objections I've heard against it have actually come from people who are concerned about potentially it being used to, to shoehorn further shredding of the, um, of the welfare state. Yes. And I would not support that. That's not the point. My, my backing for it is all about um, what Richard was saying really about um, supporting people who have to do other things and to, to really to set a floor below which people can't fall and to say, you know, we, in, in, a, in, a, in a, a world in which we can produce um, abundant stuff, we have environmental issues and so forth, but you know, there is no reason now for people to lack. It is a distribution issue and we can solve the distribution problems. But are you, or do you not think that you're too optimistic in thinking that we can keep everything else as it is with an attack on, on the I welfare never, state I, and, and, and give basic income and, and the I state won't come? I didn't say that though, did I? I was yeah. very careful about yeah. what I said, because I said basic income and wealth taxation Together, you can't have one without the other. We have abundant capital, and we have workers struggling to get the income they need to live. Right? We need to tax wealth, 
and we need a basic income. And it's that dynamic, and that is a fundamental reordering of society, and it plays into some of the long-term trends we have going on to do with demographic changes, um, increasing number of, of elderly um, people in our society, um, and um, uh, with and the technological change, which is actually where Silicon Valley is coming from, and I don't wholly agree with what they're up to. Um, it plays into that. Um, it's really about saying we need a radical reform of society. It's worth remembering that when we've had this kind of fantasiacal stuff before, we've had radical changes which have been fiercely opposed on moral grounds at the time. I <coughs> hark back to four weeks. I mean, the obvious one is the creation of the NHS after World War II. But I was thinking also of the creation of the first state pension in 1908, which was fiercely opposed at the time on the grounds that it was a disincentive to work. Are we not seeing the same kind of stuff going on? Well, no, we can't have basic income, it's a disincentive to work. The, the work that the RSA have done shows that it's actually an incentive to work, not a disincentive. Daniel, you, you had something? Well, I don't know how good time it was about to offer. So like Daniel, my, and then maybe one my, more question, and then I think yeah, I that's enough time. Going back to the questions that were just posed, um, I think the first one is, uh, I'm very much with Richard here, that it takes international cooperation to plug some of these holes in the global economy, and for that reason, it's, I mean, for many reasons, but also for that reason, it's very unfortunate that this country has decided to leave the European Union, because that right now seems to be a cooperation of countries at a level where, if the political is there, they can actually get something done, as you said, on the global level that looks kind of shaky these days, um, but it's also big enough for it to, to be meaningful. It's a market to which many countries crave access, and that market power, the power to set the terms and the conditions on which other countries can access the European Union's market, can be used to real effect, to arm twist other countries or other things. So it's really too bad that the UK has opted to go the other way. But you asked about the global crisis. Um, yes and no. I think on some level, yes, this is going to be a global crash of some sort. You know, we see manifestations all around the globe. But then, I think we shouldn't forget that even the United Kingdom, but also elsewhere in Europe, you know, we live on a pretty high level, on a level that isn't enjoyed by most other citizens of this earth, you know. And they all have, and they have, right now as we speak, much more urgent problems than what happens to their pension funds, because they don't have a pension fund, right? You know, this is, it's really, a financial crisis in some ways is really a luxury problem, you know. As, <laughs> seriously, as, you know, as, as odd as that sounds. And so I think the real effect of that is going to be that it's going to put yet another dent into a global financial system that continues to be dominated by the U.S. dollar. I think that is the thing in the United, the United States, certainly under its current president, continues this course towards really more inward-looking, a self-destructive kind of economic, and also political course that it's taken. Then the next crisis may be enough, I don't know, it depends on what the Chinese do and what the Europeans do, but may be enough to knock the dollar off its pedestal. And once that happens, I think you'll see reshuffle in global debt and financial markets unlike anything that we've seen so far. Who would like to ask the last question? I think everyone's ready to go home. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry, this lady here. Um, there are a couple of things. One thing, I think, um, well, I will ask a question. Um, so, I wonder if we actually need to reframe how we talk about the motivation or the really uh, grounds for corporate taxation. Because often I think we too much put emphasis on as if like asking them to be generous, to do a charity because people don't have enough money and there are schools and hospitals and all that, instead of actually saying that the state essentially is just like one of the shareholders of their business and it's a legitimate right to get something back as well from providing infrastructure and everything. And there are definitely examples in this country as well where government has invested massively in businesses for them to exist. So, and it's not my idea, it's Mariana Mazzucato, for example, if you know. So I'm just thinking if this is something what we need to develop further as a, as a way to essentially change this relationship between the state and the corporates. And it's not about charity, it's not about saving people, helping them and, you know, uh, but it's actually paying their due really fair, and I think that's a bit where the 
discourses. And maybe one more point. Um, last two years I have been really working with uh, organizations across the Europe and, and beyond on tax justice issues and campaigning and NGOs. And, and I would slightly disagree about the momentum. I think the me momentum is really there and there are so, so, so many people and there is so much energy to fight. But the problem is also, as the political space has been captured, also the civil society space has been captured. And, you know, the ability actually to, to do this work is, is so much, I think there is other uh, elements of funding and, and even your ability to really campaign against these issues because, yeah, we know who we target. Well, I think that's actually um, a really good place to end it because um, uh, it, it picks up, doesn't it, on um, Nick's point earlier that this time round there are a lot more people who are awake. You know, we, we remember very clearly what happened 10 years ago and we, we've seen the result of the UK general election um, uh, surprise everyone. And I think, I think that would be one of my takeaways from this evening. Um, and I very much like um, Richard's idea of a national investment bank funded by Huey. And the gentleman from the audience, he said uh, the government should simply cancel the debt that it's issued and then bought from itself. Um, we've had lots of good contributions this evening. And thank you, Dan, for coming over from Amsterdam and every other down, down to the south. And um, uh, I hope you'll stick around for the screening of the spider's web, which is coming up next. I promise we won't all be sitting in front of the screen for that. We'll put it somewhere more accessible. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.